actual only to the individualistic interests of a single country. The fourth stage uh, covers the beginning of the 20th century was uh, characterized by the dominance of two approaches, separatist and relative. And uh, now, now we, uh, and in the late 2010s, uh, it started the fifth, the, late, the, the latest uh, uh, stage of the development of the concept of autonomy. Uh, and at the same time, uh, the, the late, uh, the period as it covered the late 2010s uh, became the another crisis test for, for the Latin American countries. It led to the emergence of a new approach to autonomy and integration, effectively ending the history of classic and shamefully strong autonomy. So by the end of the second decade of the 20th century, Latin American countries found itself between two fires. On the one hand, it was a relative decline of the US, US influence in the Western hemisphere. On the other hand, the, the worsening, the worsening er, rivalry between China and the United States, uh, which has become a special uh, distinguishing feature of the 21st century. The confrontation between two powers intensified against the background of the confrontation between global two global trends that determine determined the contours of the system of international relations, interaction at the level of states where the importance of uh, protecting its borders, territories, and sovereignty was emphasized, came into conflict with the localized trans uh, transnational interaction where the concept of borders, of borders is blurred and an important role is assigned to the new subject of war politics. All this gave rise to geopolitical competition, increasing, uh, increased international tension, and as a result, the emergence of new challenges for the autonomy of states. So since the late 2010s, the region, uh, Latin, Amer Latin American region has become politically frag fragmented, which was confirmed by the stagnation of the main regional uh, integration in initiatives, such as Mercosur, the Indian Community, Pacific Alliance, ALBA, CELAC, and UNASUR. The early 2020s were marked by the largest economic uh, downtown in the region recent history, caused by the uh, COVID-19 pandemic and the economic and the ide ideological disintegration of, of the Latin American countries. At the same time, there was a sharp change in the ideological lab of Latin America in which the new left governments began to determine, it came to dominate. Uh, uh, also, these forces recognize the importance of the multipolar world. They are uh, characterized by neither anti-Americanism uh, nor the pursuit of a radical transformation of the inter-American system. Uh, the, new, uh, the new left Latin American governments, they have a clear orientation on solving pressing practical problems such as regional and national development, rapprochement with international monetary and financial organization. As a result, the Latin American countries gradually moved from the predictable, uh, relatively constant model of inter-regional uh, relations with a specific principle of inter interstate interactions. It was replaced by the unstable, fragmented, and devoid of behavior regularity from of their relationship. These processes contrasted from, uh, with the ideas of uniting the forces of all Latin American countries that prevailed in previous historical periods. As another decline of the region economy became increasingly obvious, its level of vulnerability to external intervention increased. As a result, a new concept was formed within the Latin American region, the concept of limited autonomy. This concept was based on the idea of maintaining the equidistant position in the, in the relation of United States and China, two opposing powers of, on which the sustainable development of the region depends. The emergence of freedom and interdependence inter inter interdependence in foreign policy actions was associated both with the fragility of global and regional scenarios, with the ability of states to anticipate problems and resilient in the face of unexpected events, which allows them to reduce risks. Limited autonomy, autonomy that implies proactivity, variability, and flexibility in the face of new challenges and opportunities, 
This concept also signifies a certain type of defensive pragmatism, which consists in offering concession on specific issues that are functional to gain space or maneuver facing the possibility uh, the possible future confrontations. Integration has taken the form of niche cooperation with historically related countries, which is seen as a tool that can increase negotiation potential and strengthening the ability of counter global risks. For example, the, the, the most clear examples of the niche uh, integration are the Mexico-Argentina COVID-19 vaccine uh, strategic partnership that was created in 2020s and the Argentine-Brazilian biotechnology center that was created in 2019. So in order to maintain autonomy and limit maximal in interference from outside, the foreign policy of Latin American countries will complement participation in integration associations by forming a list of new strategic partnerships with different countries embodied in various joint programs. Autonomy enclaves must be form, uh, will be formed based on the sharing priorities uh, and through the niche diplomacy. And for now, uh, uh, to study the Latin American region, we have to take into account that the countries of Latin American uh, region are uh, are uh, developing so-called 3M diplomacy, the diplomacy which is multidimensional, uh, multilateral, and multilevel, uh, which covers not only governments but also local uh, authorities, civil society actors, scientists, businessmen, and ordinary citizens. So, uh, by my, by my modest speech, I, I give uh, a start. To, to our round table that, that is called Global Geopolitical Transformations, Opportunities and Implications for Latin American uh, and Caribbean countries. And uh, I, I pass uh, the word to the representative of the, uh, of the leadership of our faculty of, inter of World Political uh, F and, and, uh, for, and International Affairs of HEC University uh, to Dmitry Novikov, who will <laughs> says uh, that our round table is uh, interesting and important for all the HC university. <laughs> so you just defined uh, what I have to say, right? <laughs> well, usually it is like that because uh, it's not like I'm an intellectual contributor. Uh, but uh, true, I'm a, a deputy head of the department and deputy head of the laboratory where this um, project is implemented and i just want to say that truly it is a very important and uh, interesting project from what uh, point of view truly there are a lot of debates about uh, transformation of the global order and uh, both on the global and regional level and if you look at other regional regional sub orders right we will see some kind of similarities. Uh, we see rise of tensions, uh, conflicts, sometimes even a war. It is a very classical way of transformation of international order. We see it in Europe now, we see it in the Middle East, uh, we see rising tensions in Asia. And uh, yes, uh, there is some kind of tendency of shaking of international structures which were uh, which existed uh, before during the so-called unipolarity but latin america is a little bit different right we see a little bit different picture uh, what does not mean that it is not transforming right it is not passed through some kind of evolution moreover latin america also contributes either to transformation of global order too. And uh, from this perspective, I think that uh, speaking about geopolitics in Latin America, speaking about transformation of Latin American regional order is important from both uh, academic and practical point of view. Academically, it is some kind of, um, I would say, um, mm, a better, uh, knowledge of a broader picture, right? It is a contribution to debates about transformation of international order. And yes, Latin America is a little bit specific. 
but uh, the process of term transformation could also be in this way, right? And uh, that might be an interesting academic contribution that there might be not bear or not be an open war or whatever, like Europeans got used to to see this process. However, um, uh, it is also a process of transformation. Practically, of course, it is important to understand what, what is going on there. I would say especially for, for Russia, because uh, in some way uh, we lost that level of expertise which existed in Soviet times, but uh, we are doing our best uh, to rise up this expertise, to make it better. And uh, I think that from this perspective, it is a, a very good contribution to not only on academic level, but also on practical level. And the third, it is important that this project is not only about uh, the people who are involved in this project speaking uh, between each other. It is a broader discussion with uh, including foreign uh, experts and scientists. And from this perspective, it is also an important third function of this project involvement of our, of the world to this kind of discussion, which is very important because academic openness is uh, the last openness which we still didn't lose, right? In this, uh, in this age of global turbulence. So from this perspective, I just would like to say that my personally totally support and uh, I want to witness and uh, listen to this discussion very carefully. Uh, and Professor Lukin, who unfortunately was not able to be here, the head of the department, he is now in the in the plane, but he also said, uh, asked me to say hello. And uh, he would like to uh, read the articles and papers, which would be a result of this discussion, definitely, for sure. So thank you so much. And uh, I just want to, what, what I need to do to wish you good luck or whatever. What, what you should, um, right? Yes. Uh, OK. Thank you so much uh, for Dmitry Noikov, who gave uh, a great start for us for our round table. And uh, now. Uh, now we are starting with our foreign experts. We have a uh, several um, for, uh, foreign experts that will participate in our roundtable. And I have a sp special pleasure to give the word to Steve Elner, who is the associate managing editor of the Latin American P uh, Perspective Journal. Steve Elner is a famous American specialist in Venezuela. He's an author of numerous books and journal articles on Venezuelan history, uh, political parties, and organized labors, and uh, organized labor. And the title of his rep report is the Venezuelan 2024 presidential election. What is what is at stake? Will, will it be fair? So uh, as we know, all eyes are on Venezuela now. So Steve will give us his view on the political situation in that important Latin American country, please. Uh, we can hear you. Thank you very much. Ah. Uh, thank you very much for that introduction. Um, yes, uh, I think that this kind of open discussion, uh, academic discussion, which really spills over to the non-academic world uh, is extremely important, especially at this moment of such global tensions uh, taking in all the countries of the world, specifically the tensions between the United States and Russia, the tensions between the United States and China, uh, and much of the rest of the world. So I think that this exchange of you know, opinions and viewpoints um, regarding such an important region in the world is extremely important. Um, specifically, I'd like to talk about Venezuela. I'd like to talk about the upcoming presidential elections in Venezuela. Venezuela is really um, the focus of a lot of analysis and discussion uh, in Washington uh, at this particular moment. I'm in Venezuela right now, uh, but I go back and forth between Venezuela and the United States, specifically Washington, or the outskirts of Washington, where, I where I'm based. And um, I believe that 
to understand what is currently taking place in Venezuela, that the context, the broader context is extremely important. You really can understand journalistic accounts that focus on daily events, uh, breaking news, really leave an, a misleading impression as to what's happening. The context with regard to the presidential elections in Venezuela, which, will, which, are, which are slated for the second half of 2024, um, in which President Nicolas Maduro will be running against, um, or the main candidate at this particular moment, uh, is Ma Maria Corina Machado. Uh, so you have a polarization left, right. M M Maria Corina Machado is identified with the right, Maduro with the left uh, side of the political spectrum. But I think that the context is important. The context, the regional context, for instance, uh, is is crucial. What is happening um, in Latin America uh, over the recent past, over recent years, um, is that you have a polarization. You have um, central left and left governments uh, or political parties and political leaders pitted against the right. Uh, it's quite different from, say, in the 1960s when the pro-U.S. candidates or the people that were closest to the United States or the United States was closest to them tended to be political moderates. Um, Look at the elections that are coming up on November 19th in Argentina that will pit um, Javier Millet against Sergio Massa, who represents the Peronistas, who identified with the moderate left, the, this, I'd say the center left. Well, Millet uh, is located on the far right of the political spectrum. Uh, he uh, denies global warming. He supports openly carrying arms. Uh, and he really uh, has been labeled by some a libertarian anarchist. Um, in some cases, you have these progressive governments, what I'll call progressive governments, governments that are center left or left, uh, or pitted against business people, such as in the case of Ecuador, Daniel Naboa just uh, won the elections against Gonzalez, who is the candidate of Rafael Calde um, Correa, who's considered a leftist. Uh, and Nabo is the son of the richest person in, in Ecuador. He was born in Miami, as a matter of fact. Uh, he's not really, at this point, located on the right side of the political spectrum, but he represents you know, business interests. Uh, Macri, who um, was elected president in Argentina, was a right-winger and uh, a business, a wealthy business person. Uh, Piñera in Chile was one of the richest or is one of the richest people in, in Chile and a right winger. Uh, then the candidate uh, who ran against the progressive candidate was Jose Antonio Cast, the son of a German Nazi who fled uh, Germany uh, in, in, in 1950. So that you, you have this polarization on the one hand, uh, candidates who are considered or consider themselves, not everybody considers them, but they consider themselves or they're identified with the left side of the political spectrum against uh, people on the right side of the political spectrum who are openly pro-neoliberal and in other cases, business wealthy business people. And in a lot of cases, they're both. They're right wing and they're, they're coming from the business sector. The other political context um, that is important to understand what's happening in Venezuela is the context in Venezuela going back 20 years. Uh, it's not really possible to have a good idea what's happening today with the upcoming elections that pit, you know, President Maduro against Machado. Um, at this point, we're not really sure what's going to happen in the next couple of months, but there's obviously a polarization between the left and the right. But in order to understand that, we have to consider that the opposition that Machado represents um, has been involved in destabilization efforts um, over the last 20 years. Going back to the coup attempt against Chavez in April of 22, he was ousted for two days. 
Uh, and incidentally, the acting president during those two days was the head of the business organization, the main business organization, Fede Commodus. And then you had a general strike that lasted uh, two months, which was really somewhat of a lockout. The president of Fede Commodus, who succeeded that president, uh, led the walkout. Um, and then you had uh, street disturbances. You had elections whose results were not recognized by the opposition. As a matter of fact, Maria Corina Machado becomes well known following the recall election held in, April, in August of 2004, in which she was the vice president of an important NGO. Uh, and she claimed that those elections were rigged. And that's been the line of the opposition um, in different electoral contests, contexts which she is identified with. Now her people, her supporters claim that she's different, that all these attempts at political destabilization were led by political parties that she has distanced herself from. She in a certain form represents the politics of anti-politics. Um, nevertheless, these destabilization, destabilization attempts, uh, she supported. Uh, the most, the first really big uh, street confrontation that took place took place in 2014. Um, it lasted two. Uh, it lasted uh, four months, um, and uh, it was in Venezuela called the Guarimba street confrontations, in which the stated aim was uh, regime change, uh, and that was called for by the head of the main party of the radical right, uh, Leopoldo Lopez. And when he called for that, um, when he talked about uh, getting rid of the president, President Maduro in 2014, uh, he called it La Salida, which means the, the, the exit, the exit of the president. Uh, Maria Corina Machado was by his side, was right next to him. Uh, when he was talking and calling for the ouster of President Maduro. And those kind of tactics went, uh, continued. Uh, and, they, and each time they failed. Um, the Guarimba of 2017, it was the same kind of thing, a four month period of street confrontation, open confrontation with the security forces and much more bloody than the one in 2013. There were an estimated 100, over 130 deaths as a result of those confrontations. So that, and then the uh, president of the National Assembly called, uh, declared himself president of Venezuela. That is Juan Guaido. And he was openly supported by the president of the United States, President Trump, and supported by the leaders of both parties in Congress in the United States. Um, and, you know, there was a uh, invasion of paramilitary forces from Colombia, which was financed by Guaido, which was also a failure. So they were one failure after another. And the situation today is the vast majority of Venezuelans and the vast majority of Venezuelans who avidly oppose President Maduro also oppose the leaders of the opposition. So what I said before about the politics of anti-politics, the people in Venezuela, the vast majority of people in Venezuela, and I say that not only on the basis of the fact that I'm here and I talk to people, but on the basis of all the all the surveys, 70, at least 70% of the population don't want to have anything to do with political leaders. They don't want to have anything to do with anybody who had anything to do with Guaido because of the complete fiasco of Guaido, which is recognized, you know, every place except in Miami, that uh, Guaido was a complete failure. Uh, he created expectations. He said that he was going to, you know, get rid of Maduro in the near future. Uh, he, uh, his party supported a coup attempt uh, on March 30th of 2019. And the list goes on and on and on. So people it kind of felt that they were, the people of the opposition felt that they were being uh, deceived. And so there's this feeling, we don't have, want to have anything to do with either side. So Machado comes along and her advisors undoubtedly have told her, 
distance yourself from the leaders, uh, the main leaders and the main parties of the opposition. So that's what she's trying to do. But the fact of the matter is that, as I said before, she has supported all the regime change attempts that have taken place, um, at least since the um, recall election that was held in 2004. Um, so let's see, I realize that there's a time factor here. Um, but let me just say that uh, in the few minutes that I have left, um, let me say that I believe that uh, Maduro, President Maduro, is playing hard, hardball. Uh, he is really uh, taking measures that people in the opposition consider with a certain amount of um, backing in terms of um, their arguments uh, are illegal. For instance, uh, he has declared Maria Corina Machado um, uh, inhabilitado, which means that she is not able to run for president. Uh, and the argument is, among others, that she supported efforts to strip Venezuela of the ownership of its assets abroad. And the most important one was the oil company, the biggest distributor of gasoline in the United States, Citgo, which was 100% owned by Venezuela, which Guaido, supported by her, um, uh, claimed was his because he claimed that he was president of Venezuela. And see, so he took over the running of Citgo, and now Citgo is being um, given to uh, different creditors uh, of the Venezuelan government. So the Vene the so the majority government and, and specifically the controller Elvis Amoroso um, has declared her uh, um, unable to run in these elections. Now the media. In the United States, and when I say the United States, I really mean much of the world, because the U.S. media uh, is very influential when it comes to the media throughout the world. And what the media is saying or leaving people to believe is that since Maduro's support um, doesn't exceed 30 percent of the voting population, that therefore, if 70% of the population doesn't support Maduro, then if he wins, uh, either one of two things are going to happen next year. Either he's going to be defeated because 70% are opposed to him, or else um, there'll be fraud. And that is really a misleading statement because it completely ignores or underestimates the divisions within the opposition. And the fact that these divisions in the opposition are going to mean that there'll be more than one candidate, um, which means that the opposition's vote will be split. But in addition to that, and I think more important than that, is the fact that, you know, the main parties of the opposition are opposed to her uh, from an ideological viewpoint. She is a far rightist. She talks about massive privatization and privatization of the oil industry which is something that most Venezuelans reject. Um, she supports the sanctions, which most Venezuelans reject. As a matter of fact, just hours after she won the internal primaries of the opposition, which was last Sunday, uh, not this last Sunday, the Sunday before, um, she, uh, at the Luis Vicente Leon, who's the leading pollster here in Venezuela, and a member of the opposition, openly identified with the opposition, said she's opposed, she supports the sanctions against Venezuela, but 70% of her supporters, according to his surveys, he said more than 70% of, of her supporters oppose the sanctions. So there's a real division there. And it's no, um, it can't be assumed that just because Maduro enjoys 70%, only 30% of the support the majority of Venezuelans uh, may consider themselves Chavistas. They they liked Chavez when he was president. They don't like Maduro. Uh, but that means they can go either way. Um, or that means that they may not vote. And abstention is an important factor in these elections. So that um, 
uh, it's really anybody's guess as to what uh, will happen. But just to uh, give you just one last um, thought here, and that is that Maduro has proved to be uh, a, a really uh, adroit strategist, which everybody recognizes, even the opposition people. They thought that he would be out shortly. They, the head of the General Assembly of, of, the, of the opposition, Henry Ramo, said he'll be out in six months. That was back in 2015, 2016. Um, but he's lasted. He survived in spite of the opposition of the United States, in spite of the, the sanctions and, and, and the military tactics against, against him. Uh, the opposition thought that a, a, a former bus driver, that's, that's, you know, uh, that's what he is. He was a trade union leader. He comes from the working class. Uh, maybe as a result of a, a, a class, upper class uh, mindset, which characterizes the upper class here in Venezuela and characterizes many leaders of the opposition, um, they, they felt that a former bus driver isn't going to be able to face such stiff opposition, but he has. And one of the tactics that he has used, or really strategies that he has used, has been to implement policies that are favorable to the private sector. Uh, and there's somewhat of a tacit alliance with the private sector. The Fede Comdes, which I mentioned before, which led the coup against Chavez and the general strike against Chavez in 2002, 2003, um, they're fairly friendly uh, with Maduro. They like some of his reforms. And his reforms are inspired, according to him and others, by the Chinese model. Um, specifically uh, um, uh, economic, special economic zones, which, which the Chinese under Deng implemented uh, for the Southeast uh, China along the, the coast there and then expanded. Um, and the Venezuelan government is implemented, implementing the same kind of tactic, the same kind of strategy. So uh, Maduro has proved to be uh, more of an adroit political strategist than the opposition gave him credit for. And so just to sum up, I would say that it's a complex situation. Uh, the media, the corporate media that claims that he can only win by fraud, I think is misleading people uh, because it's anybody's guess as to what can happen in the presidential elections of 2024. Thank you so much for your speech. Uh, we have one question <laughs> from Tatiana Vrtnikova, who is a representative of uh, Institute for Latin, American uh, for Latin American Studies of the uh, Russian Ac Academy of Science. Yeah, thank you very much, Professor, for your very interesting report. And uh, as you have started uh, your speech, with um, this very wide uh, panoramic view on the uh, processes that um, we can uh, see nowadays in Latin America. So my question is a little uh, wider than, uh, than specific Venezuelan case. Uh, and uh, mm, uh, we in, in our academic uh, community, we like to use um, such an instrument or a model of a pendulum. Uh, it's like in a wall clock, uh, the pendulum who moves from left to right to describe what is happening in Latin America. For example, uh, first in the beginning of the century, we had uh, what we call left turn, then it was a, a kind of right turn. Now we also can uh, um, see that uh, uh, nowadays what is happening, we sometimes called pink wave. Uh, and uh, what do you think, what is your opinion on this uh, pendulum okay, model? Uh, does it really work? Uh, is it workable? Or it is just imaginary uh, thing that we had in our heads? Thank you. Sure. Um, yes, you know, in 2015, that term, that model, you, you call model, that concept of the pendulum, uh, was being invoked. Jorge Castaneda, who's a leading political scientist in Mexico and a political actor, former political actor uh, in Mexico, 
uh, use that that concept, saying that it, it's the pendulum now is moving in a right direction, and that happened because, uh, specifically in two thousand and fifteen, uh, Macri, when Mauricio Macri was elected president, a right winger uh, and a business person in Argentina, and shortly after that, in Venezuela, in December of two thousand and fifteen, the opposition gained control of the General Assembly. Uh, the National Assembly in Venezuela. And then after that, Evo Morales was defeated in a referendum with regard to whether he could run for president again. There was a series of defeats um, for the progressive governments, which some people call the, the pink tide. But the fact of the matter is that what you have playing out in Latin America, I think that the, the model of the pendulum uh, is not the best way to visualize what's happening, because what's happening is fairly unique in Latin American history. You have never had um, such a number of countries that have moved in a leftist, center leftist direction. Let's say leftist direction because it's moving in that direction. Um, uh, just the numbers really uh, break with any pattern in the past. You know, Samuel Huntington, the famous U.S. political scientist, talked about waves of democracy when left, you know, de democratic movements replaced military governments uh, throughout the world, but specifically in Latin America. And you had that after World War II. You had that in the 1960s. You had that, and then in the 1980s as well, the so-called transition to democracy. So, but you compare what's happening in Latin America today with those historical uh, episodes, and it's taking in more countries. I mean, you, you, it takes in Mexico, Honduras, El Salvador, it took in El Salvador, Colombia, Venezuela, Bolivia, Ecuador. Now, you know, the, the candidate of the progressives lost, but she almost won in these recent elections. Argentina, and it looks like the Peronistas are going to win there with their candidate, Sergio Massa. Um, Chile, Brazil. Uh, now, there's a great amount of variation. There is some degree of conflict between those countries, but really nothing compared to the past. Because as was mentioned, uh, you have uh, organizations that take in uh, all the Latin American countries based on the unity of Latin America, um, such as CELAC, uh, such as the Group of Puebla, etc. Uh, UNASUR, uh, ALBA, so that there's a degree of harmony and unity that never existed in the past. And there is a larger number of countries that belong to this bloc, much more so than in the past. And they have been in power for a longer period of time. After all, that process began with the election of Chavez in 1998. And now we're in 2023. So we're talking about 25 years. And that's a long time. Uh, uh, dear Professor Steve Elner, thank you for uh, thank you again for accepting our invitation for participation in our roundtable. Now we are passing to the uh, to our second speaker, who is Daniel Hellinger. He is a professor emeritus in Webster University in the U.S. Daniel Hellinger is a known American specialist in Latin America. And uh, also, uh, he has also published uh, various um, uh, uh, papers on US politics. Uh, he's an uh, author of various books about Latin America, in particular, Global Security Watch, Venezuela, Comparative Politics of Latin America, Dem Democracy at Last, among others. The title of the, um, Daniel Hellinger's reports is the erosion of sovereign control of nature in the new world order. Please, Professor. Thank you very much. I want to extend greetings to everyone. Um, I was at your university in 1994, when I'm sure many of you know, things were, times were very hard. And uh, it's helped me to understand uh, uh, Russian attitudes, Russian point of view about world affairs, because I know the context from which Russia has come in that period, having seen it directly in my, in my visit in that year. Um, 
Also, I want to extend special greetings to Steve, who he and I have worked on various projects together involving uh, Venezuelan politics. Finally, uh, moderator, if you would please, I'll try to keep my remarks to about 10 minutes. That's probably not going to happen, but I invite you to maybe just butt in and say two minutes uh, because uh, I really want to hear the rest of the presenters and it looks like we're running considerably behind. Uh, so I'm going to talk about sovereign control over nature. And uh, I'll, I'll actually probably focus a lot on Venezuela too, since that's an area of expertise and it may help put Steve's remarks on the politics in some further context. Uh, but I also uh, am involved in a project about sovereign control over natural resources. Um, I'm, I'm using basically the Venezuelan case and the Chilean case. Uh, Venezuela, uh, has been uh, a, especially an important country in terms of sovereign control over natural resources on a global level, because um, it was the largest and most important exporter of oil until the early 1950s. And whereas in the rest of the in most of the re most of the rest of the world was either uh, in a different political bloc, the communist bloc, or was um, in the um, or or was still under colonial or neo-colonial rule, uh, Venezuela, on the other hand, was a sovereign nation, uh, certainly dependent and highly influenced by the United States as the hegemon in the region. But nonetheless, at least it had its political sovereignty, and it used that political sovereignty to um, to gradually, over the course of a century, in the period from roughly 1920 until 1974 to make steady progress in terms of asserting that sovereignty through its ministry of oil, through the way in which it administered concessions to foreign companies. Uh, but but it, it, it gradually, over the period of 50 years, acquired considerable expertise and capability to limit the ability of these companies to simply operate the way they wanted to. And I'll just say right now that I'll take a position which probably is would be quite controversial in Venezuela itself, that right now I am less concerned by what happens to PDVSA, whether it's privatized or not, than I am over Venezuela recovering that capacity to control and deal with its own natural resources, and not just oil, but all of the considerable bounty of natural resources. And that, that what happens in Venezuela is probably going to have some uh, important influence over what happens in the rest of Latin America. I think the same I could say of Chile, uh, whereas Venezuela's role in oil, global oil politics was key up until about 1974. Um, it has um, ceded that, con that control to powerful other global interests, including Saudis in particular. Um, but... Uh, but in Chile, it was the most important producer, the largest producer and exporter of what was the second most important commodity, which was copper. And uh, the Chile and Venezuela played very important roles in the struggles in the 1970s to achieve what was then called the new economic international order. And there was considerable optimism that this could be possible in the 1970s partly because of the, what proved to be a temporary, but was a perceived at that time, retreat of the United States in the wake of defeat in Vietnam, the rise of the final most important colonial, anti-colonial movements of national liberation movements in Africa, um, and, uh, and the advance and achievements of OPEC in the world at that time. Uh, however, what happened was the nationalization of, of the oil company was treated as a great uh, victory in Venezuela um, and, and not entirely unjustified. However, uh, what happened was that all, so many of the, of the gains that were made in the late concession era, gains that resulted in Venezuela gaining control over pricing of oil, together with OPEC, uh, the capacity to really uh, set the terms by, of foreign investment in the oil industry. And that was rooted in its, in its uh, mining uh, and oil industry, uh, ministry, all right? 
So you had the government ministry really in control of oil policy. What happened with nationalization what, with, that gave the illusion in Venezuela that all of that had been settled. There was no reason really to have a strong mining ministry, uh, excuse me, oil ministry, uh, control oil policy because the oil industry is now, now ours. And in fact, in the nationalization law, the PDVSA, the national oil industry, was organized to as a commercial enterprise. Um, gradually, the, 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 it was run by a group of oil men who uh, had come Venezuelans, but had come out of the um, of the of the foreign oil uh, three major foreign oil companies. Um, and very soon, and particularly after 1983, and I, I wish I had more time to go into the details, these, the Petit Vese began to take more and more control over oil policy itself away from the ministry. And to a certain extent, there were structural reasons why that happened. That is, there were reasons having to do with things going on in the world economy. Um, there was the debt crisis, uh, took away a lot of power from Latin American countries to control their natural resources. Um, but in particularly in the case of Venezuela, uh, very bad management. Uh, some of some control over PDVSA was recaptured in the Chavez years, particularly in matters dealing with uh, recover, making getting full recovery of the profits due to the country. But in some ways, Chavez never really dealt with the fundamental problem of strengthening the oil ministry and of uh, fi taking, finding a way of taking the bust, the, the, the huge profits in the, uh, for a period of about seven, eight years and effectively using them. Uh, and if, and, and um, well, boy, now I'm really gonna get into the, into the weeds as we sometimes say finding a way of dealing with the problem that then the, the illusion that uh, everything was going well in Venezuela and the, and, and the way in which uh, continued extraction of oil and sale on the world market at, at high prices uh, was funding, in a sense, the, the, the revolution that Chavez was trying to carry out. Um, that's a lot to take in at one time, I know that. Uh, if I go back for a moment to the concession era, what were concessions about? Well, basically, foreign investors in Venezuela in mining or in oil, oil obviously was most important. Um, and and I, I want to also say that this 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 kind of concession system operated in Argentina and in, in Chile throughout Latin America. Um, what was what were the concessions? Well, concerned with well fiscal terms, right? Um, at the peak, the of power in the concession era, um, states had the ability, or Venezuela in particular, had the ability to basically set royalty fees and to set and to change the levels of taxation. Legally, the country had accomplished that in 1943 in an oil reform, but it had never been fully used and realized um, until the OPEC, the late OPEC era. At that point in time, the companies had to be satisfied with what in cap a capitalist system is a normal rate of profit, right? So that had been accomplished in Venezuela. In addition, Venezuela had set up its own national company because the, another thing concessions determine are when leases expire. So Venezuela had set up a national oil company that could actually then co-compete in Venezuela with both national private and with foreign private companies. Well, with the nationalization process, the whole planned process of reversion was abandoned entirely. And instead, eventually, as I said before, oil policy ended up being carried out by the oil company. And that's still true in Venezuela to a great extent. The only difference is now under Maduro, we have no idea what the terms of contract are that has been hidden from the Venezuelan public. Um, other things in um, things covered were rates of depreciation. Reversion also include rules that made sure that the foreign oil companies, when they left Venezuela, had to leave the infrastructure in the oil fields intact. Um, 
It controlled profit remittances, typically. It controlled um, uh, the conditions under which new uh, uh, exploration and exploitation could take place. And it included provisions for technical transfers. Kind of basically, then, what you had in the concession era were, was, by the end of it, considerable gains, gains that were so great that really for foreign oil companies and mining companies, it didn't matter as much whether they owned the industry anymore. Basically, they were in a position to capture the national oil companies as their own agents within the, com within the countries. That didn't have to happen. I'm not, I'm not saying this in a deterministic way under nationalization, but effectively it did happen. Um, so the, the, I'm gonna just deal with one other, one rarely looked at but very important feature of what happened between then the transition from the concession era to what I'll call the session era. That is where other agents other than the, where the state hived off its control over oil and mining to an essentially a, uh, a public company, but one that operated like a private enterprise. Um, in the concession era, uh, in the 1950s, Argentina started inserting a phrase in all contracts for concessions called the Calvo Clause. And the Calvo Clause basically said, all dispute resolutions will be carried out in the courts of the nation, all right? So sovereignty and autonomy, I will say, control over natural resources, basically in terms of adjudicating disputes, for example, if, a if, a, if, if you wanted to change the terms of compensation or a reversion, or you felt, oh, there's an oil boom going on and the oil companies or the mining companies are profiting, you could use your sovereign powers of taxation to capture more of the profits, okay? Ultimately, if the companies didn't like it, they didn't have any place to go beyond the national courts, which sometimes might agree with them, but ultimately sovereignty rested in national courts. With the signing of bilateral and multilateral trade treaties, all of those treaties have provisions that require international arbitration in forums held up by the International uh, Commerce Commission or by the World Trade Organization. Right now, Venezuela has actually had some success in the courts when it comes to dealing uh, with the states, um, with the uh, with the law, with with the, the contracts by which the companies operate. Um, and by the way, this includes Chinese companies that had clashes with the Chavez administration. Um, but all of these, but for the most part, all of the contracts signed between PDVSA with um, service companies, whether Chinese, Russian, Iranian, you name it, all of those contracts are subject to international arbitration. Okay, So they are out of the control of the Venezuelan state. And this has happened throughout Latin America, not just in Venezuela. I wanted to, to make this point that in a way, I want to treat Venezuela as a case. Um, if, we, if I had time to do a to, to deal with Chile, and I don't, I would probably say Chile has a little bit better control over its Gran Minería because of all the generals never wanted to give up that control. They got 10% of all the, not the profits, but the revenues from the from Codelco, the, Chile, the nationalized Chilean copper company, nationalized by Allende, but never privatized by the generals. Um, so, so basically that operated in Chile Chile has retained some some control over it, but there are other features in Chile which the post uh, Pinochet government have failed to deal with. For example, Chile has a law that uh, put in the, by decree by the military, but it still applies in Chile. That basically says once you sign a contract for us in the mining, um, we promise never to raise your taxes. Which means, and Chile now has a has bilateral trade agreements with China. China is now the biggest investor and trade partner with Chile. All right. So in one sense, Chile has more autonomy in world politics because it is not as dependent on U.S. companies, which dominated the concession era. 
But on the other hand, structurally and in internationally, Chile still, in a sense, has not recovered control of its natural resources. One final thought. Why is this also important in, in other contexts than economic context, the ex extractivism? Well, um, anybody who's been to Venezuela, and, and I, I think Steve will be on the same page with me on this one, um, knows that the environment has been devastated by the oil industry. That doesn't have to happen. The state can exercise better control. There's, there's a lot of ways in which, in which it could have been better. Um, if, if any new government in Venezuela, left or right, more likely left, but either any, any new government in Venezuela were to say, for example, that um, we need to clean up Lake Maracaibo. It's a disaster and it's affecting the health. And so we're passing a law that requires that um, uh, uh, puts a, imposes, uh, this is all, I'm just hy hypothetical, a 1% uh, tax on profits of, uh, of, of service companies and others to clean up the, the Lake Maracaibo, they can take Venezuela to the international arbitration and probably will win their case. Okay? So in other words, that did not exist in the concessionary era. So when we think about forestry, when we think about, oh, well, you know, 25% of the world soybean production happens in the, in the Argentine, Brazilian, Paraguayan early. When we think about those resources, when we think about forestry, when we think about global ecology, in some ways, governments were in a better position in Latin America to deal with those issues in the concessionary era than they are today. Even if some governments, such as Lula's in Brazil, not Maduro, unfortunately, have a very progressive view and are very sympathetic to indigenous rights, to um, uh, to to the, uh, the global issues of uh, of the global economy. Uh, effectively, um, the the their their ability to act has been weakened considerably, and these are rarely looked at. This 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 impact of the concessionary era. Um, well, um, I welcome any of you to, I don't know how, how much time we really will have for discussion. If any of you would like to know more about this, I can point you to a few different sources, particularly if you read Spanish, I have one or two recommendations. Um, and uh, I'll, be, I'll be working on this book probably for about another year, year and a half. And I hope maybe I can share some results with you. I've uh, been delighted to have this chance to talk and uh, and to uh, present what might be a somewhat controversial theory. I'm, Steve, regardless what happens in Venezuela, and I agree with you largely on Machado in particular, um, uh, although it doesn't hurt that Maduro more or less <laughs> limited the field for the right, for the opposition. Um, I still think the most important determinant of Venezuela's future is going to be recovering some degree of sovereignty. And while Venezuela has been forced in many ways to cede that sovereignty, it's not just been within their national power to do so. At the same time, there is no, there is no widespread debate really in Venezuela over this. Privatization, you may get some debate over that, but in some ways, private is, as I said, private capital entering Venezuela it's and what's much more important is the capital from wherever it comes from needs to be controlled. The problem is capitalism, not whether it's public companies acting like cap, like private capitalist firms or um, or or foreign investors. So it may be wiser to allow foreign investment in under concession and go back to the concessionary era and keep PDVSA public. That would be what I prefer, but I don't think that's going to happen. Thank you very much to everyone. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor. We have uh, one question for, from our listener. Yeah, thank you so much for a very interesting report. Honestly, I'm not an expert in Latin America, so maybe my question would sound a little bit stupid. Uh, so, But uh, it's not a central point of your report. Still, you mention this um, China... United States of America competition in the region, right? 
So, you know, in the 19th century, there was a term, uh, the big game between Great Britain and Russia in Central Asia. So if we um, kind of uh, use this analogy to Latin America, uh, could we say that there would be some kind of uh, big game between China and the United States of America in Latin America, but not geopolitical or rather geoeconomic? And what kind of role Venezuela can play in this process? Uh, could it be like uh, Iran in the 19th century, like oil producer, authoritarian, for which uh, two huge powers fight to control economic resources of the region? Oh, it's a very good question. Um, uh, let's see where to start. Um, I think you have to differentiate between different regions and what exactly is being contested at the time. For example, um, as much as I fully back Cuba's right to deal economically and and in terms of its own security interests with Russia, China, whomever, it's a sovereign nation state. Um, certainly, if China, we'll, we'll leave Russia out of it for now, were to uh, uh, seriously increase its surveillance uh, as it seems to be doing, that would be a probably greater concern to the United States uh, than, let's say, uh, uh, China's um, uh, free trade treaty with an increased investment and trade with Chile. I don't think the economic, I, I, I think the world has moved into sort of a paradoxical, if not contradictory, contradictory position in which we have what can be called not a multinational, but transnational capitalist class. Many Chinese entrepreneurs are part of that class. Uh, Chinese economic interests, even in the Western Hemisphere, don't necessarily conflict with US interests. There's a great deal of China phobia in the United States today, sort of, oh, I, I, I live in the state of Missouri and, and both candidates for uh, the Senator in the last election uh, warned that China was buying Missouri farmland. We have to stop this. So I looked up some statistics and found out that China, uh, that that only 3% of all Missouri farmland is owned by foreigners. And of that 3%, China owns 0.1%. Let me say it again, 0.1% of all that land. And yet, there were probably the most prominent commercials in this competition between the two Senate candidates was, we've got to stop China from buying up our farmland. And I think that comes from a fear of China's economic power more than its military power. So I will say that there's, you know, there's, there's especially some reason to be concerned that in US politics, China will be made the whipping boy for all kinds of things. But I think when you look, on the other hand, at the at the role of China's investment and trade in Latin America, for one thing, one of the bigger boosts to that was um, was the uh, falling apart of the attempt by the United States to create the um, oh, what was it called at the time the multilateral trade. It was supposed to be the next step after the WTO, and I can't remember the name of uh, mutual mutual agreement on investment. And that was going to be a, a new world treaty, um, but it was especially going to draw, you know, give Latin America supposedly more access to markets all over the world. The United States very strongly pitched that. It collapsed partly in, in terms of the U.S. role because of opposition that had grown to new trade treaties. Um, the, on the other hand, what happened after that was that Latin America went ahead, Peru, particularly South America, but even Mexico and some parts of Central America began formulating bilateral treaties and ultimately even multilateral treaties in South, in, with Asia. So, so you're right that there's competition between the United States. I don't think it constitutes a great game in the way in which, for example, um, competition over Afghanistan historically has been carried out either by the British or by the American, the Russians, Chinese. I, I don't see that kind of great game on the political level. 
uh, certainly not on the economic level. Let me rephrase that. Uh, certainly on the econ not on the economic level. I think capitalism has become much too much integrated, um, even despite what the setbacks of the pandemic and the uh, uh, and the interruption and 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 the wars. Um, but I I, I do think so. So I guess in sum, in answer to your question, I think there will be some competition uh, between the United States and China if China were to become. Uh, like try, want to have bases or particularly naval bases might be of interest. I think the United States would react very strongly to that and that would that would raise tensions. I don't believe that Chinese economic investment uh, and trade with Latin America is is as big an issue as that geo more the geopolitics of of if China were to expand militarily or diplomatically. Uh, especially militarily in the United in the in the Western Hemisphere. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Professor uh, Daniel Hellinger. Uh, thanks again for participating in our modest event. And now no we are facing to uh, to Latin America and you on uh, Latin, on events in in the region. I'm I'm passing the word to the. Alexander Zhebit, he's a, a representative of Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. The title of his report uh, is The Integration, of, uh, Integration Challenges of uh, Geopolitical Transformation in Latin American Countries. So uh, I pass the word to the, uh, our speaker. Thank you. Uh, do you hear me? Do you see me? Yes, yes, we, we can see you, we can hear you. Thank you. Well, uh, hello to everybody from Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. And uh, thank you, Ekaterina, for your invitation to the round table to uh, very relevant topics to uh, which are being discussed uh, of the Latin American and world politics. And also I want to uh, greet the speakers I, I, I am speaking, will be speaking side by side. And also my greetings to Vasily Kashin and Dmitry Novikov, who are present also at this round table. First, a few words about uh, a geopolitical context. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, climate change, food, energy crises, conflicts in Ukraine and in other regions, now a renewal of the oldest regional conflict, the one in the Middle East, and also a looming threat of a nuclear war, paint a new picture of world politics when security and development in a broad sense have been jeopardized and the states entered a renewed phase of strengthening their economies, their armed forces, their immediate neighborhoods to protect their citizens in other countries and abroad and to resist hegemonic influences as well to stand up to global challenges and threats, to fight poverty, hunger, underdevelopment, climate crisis, terrorism, drugs and crime, sanitary hazards, cyber wars and real wars, and so on. So geopolitical securitization is one of the signs of the change of the world order from the Western unipolarity towards a global multipolarity. Another sign is a crisis of multilateralism in international politics. So uh, we live in this crisis of multilateralism. From a more precise perspective, what I mean uh, is a crisis in the model of universal multi multilateralism as of the United Nations and related bodies. This crisis is manifested, for example, in the inaction of the Security Council on issues of regional security and humanitarian crisis, in its operational ineffectiveness, and in the current criticism of the lack of representation and greater cultural diversity, given the emergence of new hubs of power. Currently, transnational global challenges as development and climate change and threats as nuclear proliferation and war, regional and interstate conflicts are not met efficiently and duly or are not met at all by the universal multilateralism and by the collective security of the United Nations 
and other institutions. The multipolar world is ending up being more unstable and less peaceful. The construction of communities of common and human security, the strengthening of mutual trust within and outside communities are the main elements in the formation of a viable, safe, and lasting developmental institution of governance, which must complement the common security concept of multilateralism. As it is stated in the introduction note to the seminar, the rules of interstate and interregional interaction in the context of the previously built North South hierarchy no longer apply. At the same time, as it is said, the countries of, the Latin, of Latin America and the Caribbean are striving to develop a pragmatic foreign policy, trying to play on contradictions in the context of increasing competition for influence in the Western hemisphere between the main actors of world politics. Just about some words of Latin American context. To dig more into these suggestive ideas which were proposed in the introductory note, I would not reduce the role of Latin American countries to just uh, an influenced group of countries, countries or of figurants that live up to the hegemonic patterns of alignment established during the Cold War and afterwards by the lonely superpower in the 90s. The evolution of the 90s led to a qualitatively new interactions known as regional, political, and economic integration. Yekaterina have already spoken about them, so I won't pass in all the phases. I only will speak about the last phase, the third stage, which is known as post-hegemonic regionalism which is aimed at political coordination and expansion of degrees of South American autonomy. This is when uh, uh, South American regionalism started to develop. In 2008, the Union of South American Nations, UNASUR, was formally set up, reinforcing a new wave of regionalism. The UNASUR seemed to establish a regional autonomy of South America in the Western Hemisphere. Brazil was the driving force behind the creation of the UNASUR and also of the South American Defense Council, an institution established in 2009 in order to consolidate the region as a zone of peace and democratic stability. Uh, though in 2019, the UNASUR was disbanded by the initiative of the Brazilian President Jair Bolsonaro, but efficiently reestablished after the new president, Luis Inácio Lula da Silva, returned to power in 2023. So the geopolitical framework in South America uh, gave an impetus of integration uh, to the regional role of Brazil as a leading nation. And Brazil is building a bigger influence globally by gaining leverage within existing intergovernmental institutions as an active member of the UN, now non-permanent member in the United Nations Security Council, WTO, IMF, and the World Bank. Also by vigorously advocating reforms of multilateralism, working to push for reform of the United Nations structure and Security Council and financial architecture and institutions. By taking the lead in building political and economic partnerships to maximize and spread its influence from the UNASUR, the IPSA forum, and certainly the G20 and the BRICS. And the last, not the least, by building a secure regional body that would strengthen the South American voice in global governance and in a global competition in the multipolar world. Brazil will be presiding over the G20 in 2024, will preside the BRICS in 2025, Brazil's candidacy, candidacy to host COP30 in 2025 in the middle of the Amazon rainforest in the city of Manaus is quite certain. Speaking in terms of multipolarity and world poles, Brazil is emerging as a core state of the South American pole of power in a multipolar world. But because of the multilateralism crisis in the United Nations, WTO, a belief in multilateral structures was shaken and the direction towards regionalism is now having an impetus either in Brazil 
or in South American countries. The solution through regionalism in order to stay resilient against major geopolitical changes was and has been practiced by the Asian, Eurasian and African countries, ASEAN, uh, SCO, African Union or ECOWAS. However, in resuming a geopolitics of integration, it is important to consider two sets of factors, the structural weaknesses of the region and geopolitical challenges at the global level. A strategic autonomy of South American region seems a proper course to build development with security, but it is hampered by a series of obstacles. Most important of them are, first, a growing global competition. Second, among uh, uh, um, great powers rivalry and uh, the US-Chinese global and regional rivalry. The Western, mostly USA and European Union strategies as not to relinquish their influence over Latin America and especially the South America. And mostly the regional perspective that raise important questions as to a strategic convergence and the unity of leadership amongst the South American countries as to the deepening of integration process. Uh, well, South American region uh, has a fragmentation and this fragmentation derives from geography and colonial history, from crisis and political instability which already have been mentioned by the speakers. Lack of strategic convergence and leadership and external interference into the regional politics. Uh, the absence of border disputes is a myth about the South American non-conflictual relations and a relatively peaceful coexistence. A belligerent colonial past has left scars and every country in the region except for Brazil has a border dispute with at least one member. For example, Venezuela, Guyana. These countries have a long-standing long border dispute since the end of the 19th century over the Essequibo region. Now it is very uh, relevant because of the discovery of oil reserves in Guyana, which have started to be extracted and will put Guyana into the first 10 biggest oil producers in the world. Venezuela, Colombia, Colombia, Ecuador, Ecuador, Peru, Peru, Chile, Chile, Bolivia. These two uh, countries, last countries, are the only countries in South America that do not have diplomatic relations. The second thing about crisis and political instability, Colombia was marked with 50 years of civil war in the 20s and the beginning of, the, of this century, which caused a huge emigration. Venezuela has lived lately with a civil unrest and was followed by waves of immigration. There is a political polarization, which was mentioned also with significant fluctuations in political ideological preferences by South American voters. In 2023, there is a succession of crises in, in the region. Bolivia and Argentina are going through economic crisis. Peru, the political crisis has dragged on for years. And since 2016, six different politicians have occupied the presidential seat. There were two resignations and two impeachments. In 22, the then president, the then, the then president Pedro Castillo tried to dissolve Congress, which then voted to dismiss him. In addition to the domestic issues, there are also strategic discrepancies influenced by South American geography. Historically, uh, there are differences historically and naturally. There are differences between the countries facing the Atlantic or the Pacific and uh, uh, the physical integration difficulties among, from, uh, arising from topography with mountain chains and dense tropical forests make regional communication very difficult or impossible. Historically, the infrastructure of transport in the region was financed by foreign powers aiming to support the export of commodities. Finally, there are differences between the countries that prioritize relations with different powers. The highlights 
are the cases of Venezuela with important partnership with Russia and China. Colombia with the United States is the main ally in South America. And Paraguay, the only country in sub-region that maintains diplomatic relations with Taipei. There are also divergences over development of the UNASUR and Council of South American Defense, which stem from internal visions and from hem hemispheric security perspectives. So the way out of global crisis is through regionalism, judging by Asian and European examples. Very important developments suggest a new surge of a regional integration in South America that depend on answering some very important questions. About Mercosur, will it win or will it lose from a free trade agreement with the European Union? About the organization of the Treaty of Amazonian Cooperation, which, start, which uh, is being reinvigorated, will it take hold of the Amazonian recovery, rainforest and the region? The third question, energy integration of Brazil, Argentina, Bolivia, Paraguay, Uruguay, Venezuela will take place. One more question, transport and logistics integration through Northern Amazon rainforest and the Western Andes Cordilleras chain will go on. And the transfrontier integration with police and armed forces operations will continue with the same vigor and the last but not the least, the Blue Amazon project, South Pacific and Antarctic integration, Argentina, Brazil, Chile, Ecuador, Colombia, Peru, Uruguay, Venezuela, and Zopacas, zone of peace and cooperation in the South Atlantic with Brazil, Argentina, Uruguay, and 21 West African states, which are already functional instruments of the regional integration spreading to the South Atlantic, will stay in place. So these are questions to be answered. And uh, about uh, Brazil, which is leading the process, we must just mention the Brasilia consensus in May, 2023. Uh, at the invitation of the president of Brazil, the leaders of South American countries met in Brasilia on May 30, 2023 to boost cooperation and integration in South America. They agreed that regional integration must be part of the solution to face the shared challenges of building a peaceful world uh, with the goal of an effective South American free trade area. They recognized the importance of maintaining a regular dialogue with the purpose of boosting the South America's integration process and projecting the region's voice in the world. This part of declaration, I will cite, shows an intention to create a human security community of South American states. I, uh, a citation, they agreed to promote from now on South American cooperation initiatives with a social and gender focus in areas that concern the immediate need of citizens, in particular people in vulnerable situations, including indigenous peoples, such as health, food security, food systems based on traditional agriculture, environment, water resources, natural disasters, infrastructure and log logistics, energy interconnection and clean energy, digital transformation, defense, security and border integration, combating transnational organized crime and cyber security. So a few words to conclude. The multipolar world is ending up being more unstable and less peaceful. The construction of a community of common and human security in the region through integration, the strengthening of mutual trust within and outside are the main elements in the formation of a viable, safe and lasting developmental institution of governance in South America and South Atlantic, which highlights a human development with security based on the deepening of South American regional integration. The deepening of regional integration will only th strengthen the South American voice in the UN, G20, and the BRICS. And this integration will be linked to global governance process for development with greater security 
and most stable peace. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Alexander Zhebit. Uh, yes, uh, Dmitry Novikov has a question for you. Yeah, thank you so much for the, once again. Well, first of all, uh, let me uh, use the opportunity to say hello uh, okay. to you and to Elena Ivanovna for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so uh, 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 the question might be uh, maybe a, a little bit stupid too, but you spoke about the crisis of multilateralism in the very beginning as a start point of your report. And uh, the impression which I had is that uh, there is some kind of disappointment in global multilateralism. What made uh, Latin American nations to focus more on regionalism and development of uh, regional integration? Uh, is it so? And uh, couldn't we say maybe that the picture is a little bit uh, more complicated? And that disappointment of um, in global multilateralism, crisis of multilateralism, made uh, Latin American countries uh, try to find some kind of alternative formula, like uh, well, BRICS, let's say G77. I believe a lot of Latin American countries uh, participate in this format. Uh, yeah, this is like a question. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, the question is not stupid at all. Maybe my answer may be stupid, but I will try to uh, uh, to answer you with my uh, uh, stupidity on the question about the multilateralism. Yes, of course, multilateralism is not just a way of creating a multilateral space universally. Uh, multilateralism works in maybe two, three countries, and it is multilateralism. When you speak about multilateralism applied to South America, it's not an easy way to do it, but it's now gaining an upper hand uh, in uh, connection with the world situation. I mean, situation which creates uh, threats of geopolitical nature to all the countries, not only uh, some countries of the region, but to all the countries of the region. So I think that in this uh, 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 term, integration is a movement to complement the, the world security because multilateralism means lack of uh, collective security. It means that collective security is not working properly. It is blocked in the uh, Security Council and in many decisions that are taken by the respective bodies. So uh, regional security is very important and it comes with the uh, 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 deepening of the integration process. You spoke about the G77. Yes, it's a very important forum, but it's very great. It is not very effective in terms of its decisions. I remember now the latest declaration of the G77 and Brazil is part of this group. It is about very important questions, which uh, go out uh, out of our which which are included in our discussion, but but also they are very uh, very far beyond of the discussion because they want technology and science. They want access to this because they want development. It's very important that these countries speak about development and not about the uh, questions of uh, conflicts and uh, uh, I mean threats that uh, could be evaded by more development, more peace and less uh, conflicts and confrontation. Uh, so uh, Brazil uh, is already continuing to, to be part of the G77. Uh, it's a group which uh, in, in where the voice of South American countries is, is very much present. Uh, and uh, the problem was that during the Jair de Bolsonaro government, there was a distancing from this, uh, from this group in terms that Brazil started to uh, pave its way to the o OCDE. And now it is one of the candidates to the OCDE countries. But what happened with the 
uh, advent of the Lula government is that this government state uh, was very cautious about continuing its efforts to enter the o OCDE uh, framework. The reasons I would not uh, comment now at this moment, but they are existent and they have to do with the uh, with the politics of uh, uh, Brazil in terms of the third world and its uh, important alliances with the uh, uh, northern northern part of the world. No? I mean, Western world. We have such a, a, a position in which this must be uh, viewed uh, much with much more balanced attitude and relations to these uh, propositions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you again, Professor, for participating in our round table. And now we are passing to our next speaker, uh, to Professor Steve Lawrence. He's representing the Walter State Community College uh, at the US. The title of his report is The Education Part Partnership Models of Hispanic and Caribbean Students, Cuba, Jamaica, Jamaica and the US Working to Grow Student Success. It's gonna be a very empirically rich uh, uh, report because in his, uh, in his uh, speech, Professor Lawrence will, will touch upon free experience sharing a common go uh, goal, increasing educational opportunities for Latin American Caribbean students. As a US Peace Corp uh, volunteer, Lawrence brought internet tools to very rural primary schools in Western Jamaica. He also represented the US Peace Corps and the Jamaican Ministry of Education in celebrating the dedication of a modern high school built with financial support of the Cu Cuban government. And he created access program in rural East Tennessee in the US where Hispanic immigrant students population from Mexico, Central America and South America now measures 25% of uh, public school enrollment. So uh, that's gonna be a very interesting speech, please professor. Thank you, Dr. Kosevich. And uh, I I will, in, in a moment here, if we can make the technology work, actually put some pictures on the screen, which may be a little easier to look at than my own. Aha, it, we are working. Okay, very good. So uh, when Ekaterina asked me to participate in this discussion, clearly I was honored. And I asked, might I take a little different approach and tell personal stories about my experience and how they might relate, relate to this discussion? So if we can make this work here, uh, certainly thank you to all of you, to the esteemed guest speakers. And I have learned so much from this discussion too, from political science colleagues, but just, uh, talk about, as you said, what I would like to say is that in my experience, there is a discussion of working together across political lines. So I have two very short stories that I was involved in, and we'll see where that discussion goes. A little bit about me. I recently joined the world of academia. I've been teaching at university and college for about seven years now. For much of my career, I was involved in business and I've held positions in many governments. Uh, I have one government position now. We live in the state of Tennessee and I'm an election commissioner here. Uh, I've described myself, I have lived or worked or studied or been in government service in 42 countries around the world. And I try to bring that view to my discussion here. All right. Uh, crossing political lines. I, I believe that there is a, a place at, at the ground level to build these partnerships, to build understanding, to build international understanding. And uh, one place that I have been personally involved 
is in education, early education. And uh, I find that very rewarding and also a way to understand and work together. As I said, we want all our children to learn and thrive. So again, very short stories. Uh, in 2015, I had been living and working in Jamaica for about two or three years. Uh, and in, in a very interesting situation, the government of Cuba was celebrated and I was able to represent the Ministry of Education in Jamaica the U.S. government as a government and Peace Corps employee to congratulate uh, the uh, ambassador, the Cuban ambassador to, to Jamaica for financing the building of a modern high school for young Jamaican students. And there was so much that was impressive in that partnership. Uh, first of all, it is interesting that in, in Jamaica, the primary foreign language in schools is Spanish. And so many young students are looking at Spanish as a world language to communicate. And uh, so I, I just have some quick pictures here uh, that so interesting to me that uh, these students at this ceremony were able to sing in Spanish, honoring uh, the Cuban involvement in supporting education in Jamaica. And uh, yeah, here's a little picture of me too with some of my Jamaican students at that ceremony. All right, uh, quickly going to the next experience. Uh, I worked for almost three years as a American teacher in Jamaican public schools, primary schools. And uh, the, the purpose there was to clearly help students with their English, their maths, but even more so to create the, uh, the understanding that uh, we have a, a common interest with each other in uh, continuing education. And uh, I, I have the little picture there in the in the lower corner too. Part of that process was to live in the community, to work on community projects, to be a teacher in the community. And I just have, if we can, if this will work, we'll see uh, one of my young Jamaican students saying thank you for the education. Boys and girls, a splendid afternoon to you all. Today, we celebrate our success after six well-spent years at the Noble Institution. It is with great pride and humility that we express our sincere appreciation and gratitude to all those who have dedicated their time in helping to direct and influence our lives this far. Madam Principal and teachers, you all have made an indelible mark on our young lives. Fellow graduates, we are thankful for the opportunities this school has afforded us. Let us not allow what the world thinks of us keep us from achieving our goals. Let's keep these words of Marcus Garvey in our minds. Of, the mighty, of you mighty graduates, we can accomplish what we will. Let God and the sky be our limit and eternity our measure. With confidence, you have won before you have started. Batch 2015, dream big re and reach for the stars. Let us make a difference wherever we go and do well. Thank you. <laughs> so thank you for letting me show that. Uh, it's very important. Okay. Third quick story here, uh, as Dr. Kosevich said, I live in the U.S. state of Tennessee uh, and uh, in a very rural community. Uh, uh, 
some years ago, we looked at our population here, 21% Hispanic origin in our community. But at our local college, part of the university, less than 4% Hispanic enrollment. And I said, this is not this is not representative of our goals. And we clearly had to look at what were the issues. There, there are cultural her heritage, there is language, there is a history of US racism. And without doing the whole story, we were able to put together partnership programs within the community. Uh, within the two years of the original process, we were able to double that enrollment. The idea being that this uh, this community of international experience can only be good for our community and our state. So uh, this is my chance to just tell a little bit of a story. Uh, I I was born in New York City. I've lived in many big cities. We live in a very small community here with beautiful countryside and lakes. And our small town represents 28 different cultures here that we are trying to build as an international community. So uh, I have some pictures here of some of the things that we have done to uh, to encourage our immigrant community, our international community to be recognized and succeed and thrive here. So one very quick thank you. Hello, my name is Angel, and today I will be sharing my story of how I came to the United States whenever I, whenever I was younger. Uh, I got here whenever I was in sixth grade and I was 10 years old. I started to take EOL classes and the regular English classes. And from there on, I learned the right amount of English to get through high school and learn even more English with the regular English classes. From there, I went on to graduate high school and went on to college where I now uh, major in accounting. Now it all became about the numbers and not the language. So the main reason why I decided to go to college was because my mother encouraged me to have a career, to be someone in life, to be a uh, orgullo hispano. So uh, I also encourage you to uh, do the same, to talk to your counselors, to your teachers, and they'll know what to do to help you so you can make the right decisions. Okay. So in a, in a very short, and Ekaterina, I hope I've moved us back on your schedule for this wonderful roundtable. But uh, thank you for letting me tell three very different stories from politically diverse government backgrounds with one goal. And that's, I believe very strongly, a place that we can all work together is on uh, education opportunities. So that's what I have. Thank you so much. Uh Thank you so much, uh, Professor Steve Florence, who gave us a uh, like, very live experience uh, in uh, this uh, Latin American and US issues, which is very, very interesting and untypical for us, uh, mm -hmm. who are Russian researchers of Latin American countries and Latin American US relations. Uh, so we have a time for one question. Do any listener or participant have some question for our speaker or our online uh, participants can also uh, make questions if they want oh no questions so uh, thank you again Steve, uh, professor Steve Lawrence your report uh, was very very Full, rich, and interesting for all of us. And now we are passing to the Russian side on Latin American studies. And our first uh, speaker will be uh, Tatiana Vartnikova. She is a research fellow of Institute of Latin American Studies. And the title of her report is Interests of Latin American Countries in BRICS, which is very actual and uh, interesting topic taking into account the changing role 
uh, of BRICS and the changing uh, uh, number of countries in that block. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Yekaterina, for presenting me. And uh, I just don't don't know where to look because the camera is here and the audience is there. So I will try to be somewhere in the middle and uh, uh, and present my uh, speech. Uh, so BRICS uh, is a very broad topic with a lot of experts and there are thousands and possibly millions of publications around the globe uh, that concern interaction with, within the bloc and relations between countries of five and external actors. And uh, here I would like to pick up only one issue that is interests of Latin American countries in being BRICS now. And uh, to start, I would like to underline two points um, uh, before my analysis. Uh, first is uh, that I'm not gonna talk about Brazil and because uh, um, one of the reason is of course, because I have no guts to pick up this question uh, in front of uh, Professor Jebit, who is an expert of Brazil and he is in Brazil now. And not because of this, but because I think that Brazil is another story. Uh, for now, it's something a part of my analysis here. Uh, and and uh, of course, Brazil plays a big role, but that's another thing. And second note is that I'm gonna talk only about this, those countries uh, who, um, who have already expressed their interest in uh, joining the bloc and they were mentioned um, among uh, those countries who, uh, who was in the list announced by Minister of Foreign Affairs of South Africa in anticipation of a BRICS summit that have held in Johannesburg this autumn. And they are five, as I already said, they are Argentina, Bolivia, uh, Cuba, Honduras, and uh, Venezuela. Uh, so before jumping into the analysis, I would also like to underline a mm, few things um, that are important here. And um, this is um, uh, three uh, issues uh, because I think uh, um, this is important. Uh, what uh, have already was formal formalized um, within the block of the BRICS and uh, what all the members, uh, what are the main principles that all the members of the BRICS um, are shared nowadays? So there are three. Um, first is transit to more clear and diversified international monetary system by reduction of the role of dollar and shift to the bilateral transactions in national currency. Uh, second is uh, the group of BRICS uh, calls to the changes in the global trade system and reforms uh, of the Financial Institute, as well as they stay against economical restrictions and sanctions. And third is uh, that BRICS members declare, uh, declare their commitment to strengthening global governments by the mechanisms of the multilater multilateral diplomacy, expansion of the UN Security Council, and uh, wider representation of developing countries on the global arena. Um, so these uh, three points, are important in uh, in, the, in this case because the uh, mem uh, those five countries who have expressed the interest in joining BRICS uh, have uh, um, something in common with uh, these principles. And uh, here I would like to show that next. Uh, so on this basis, what benefits could Latin American countries get from the bloc? Uh, I'll start with Argentina because not only because it's first by the alphabet order, but also because it is the only one country from the list that was uh, officially invited mm, to BRICS 11. Uh, so Argentina, Argentina's possible accession to the BRICS has been on the table for more than a decade. Uh, so this is not something very new. Uh, and for the Russian expert community, uh, uh, they normally pretended to be moderate optimistic uh, on this track, still um, the decision of uh, BRICS leaders to uh, invite Argentina was quite unexpected for everyone. Uh, and after all, nothing is uh, clear to now. Uh, the key 
Interest for Argentina consists of the credit lines provided by China and New Development Bank and other mechanisms that oblige to provide protection against global liquidity pressure. Uh, so Argentina main commerce partners are Brazil, uh, around 18% of total trade turnover in 2021, China around 15%, US around 8% and India around 4%. So as we see, three of these, mem of these partners are members of BRICS. So the BRICS narrative uh, has its solid grounds. Um, Argentina is also high, uh, has high potential in mineral reserves. And uh, for example, uh, it's the, one of the largest producers of lithium. And also it's a, uh, an agricultural giant. Uh, nevertheless, the main question for Argentina now is uh, what will be who will be the next president, and uh, this question is open for now, and then change is lost. So the two main candidates uh, has polar beliefs. For example, Sergio, Sergio Massa supports the idea of joining BRICS, but the program of his opponent um, Javier Midei has nothing in common with uh, BRICS agenda. Uh, his points, more, more of that, his point refers to quite popular opinion is that Argentina would gain nothing substantial from joining BRICS. It would be just one more uh, senseless platform to participate in high level discussion, but it's something it already has in G20 without any real positive response. Um, in addition, this decision must be ratified in both chambers of Congress, where right wing political forces. Uh, will most likely oppose it, even if Massa come to power in November. Uh, so second country is Bolivia. Uh, Bolivia officially announced its desire to join Brinks in, uh, uh, on the eve of Johannesburg summit. And the Bolivian government shares a uh, common vision on moving towards a multiple world order, as Bolivian Foreign Minister for, uh, Rogelio Maite said in his statement. Uh, the country seeks to become a more prominent player on the international arena that would contribute its main goal that lays in the economic sphere and uh, expanding cooperation with leading powers. The key interest is to expand opportunities for the national lithium sector uh, to integrate on the world market. Uh, besides, the BRICS agenda corresponds to the Bolivian government's ideological priorities to reduce dollar hegemony and diminish U.S. influence in both economic and politics. Uh, so Bolivia maintains economic relations with all uh, five countries. Uh, but uh, what is uh, the most interesting here is uh, the case of India. And only for a few years, um, it has become the main export destination for La Paz. Uh, and um, uh, also with the negative trade balance for Bolivia, which sends gold and precious stones to India instead the importing vehicles, equipment, fuel, and medicines. And more of this in the on the political um, uh, side, um, Bolivia agrees with India, India's position on the Security Council, uh, Council reform, and also supported the status of non-permanent membership of India in the UN Security Councils for the period from uh, 2021 to 2022. Uh, so uh, very briefly next is Cuba. Uh, besides the declara declarative goals that are more or less the same with the other candidates for, for Cuba, the opportunity of increasing its voice on the international arena is the most benefited. Uh, Cuba has a great experience in resistance to the Western financial system and uh, can offer political al alliances to those who have similar goals. Um, who uh, so one of those who have similar goals uh, with Cuba is Venezuela, which tries to survive in the conditions of Western sanctions and severe economic crisis. Uh, Venezuela sees the, the pillar in China and Russia, but as for the other members uh, of BRICS, relations with Caracas have far less political, uh, uh, less a political but more economical uh, has less a political but more economical benefits. Uh, that we can say about India, for example, who was buying Venezuelan oil for years without any political support for the government and trying not only uh, not to express any opinion on the internal Venezuelan crisis. In 2019, India stopped buying oil from Venezuela under the US sanctions pressure, but uh, the recent announcement of the moderation sanction regime can slightly reboot the Indian demand. Uh, 
Uh, and uh, last but not least, uh, Honduras. Uh, as for Honduras, its interest is also quite clear uh, because uh, it looks at China as the main prospective partner. In March 2023, uh, the establishment of diplomatic relations between Tegucigalpa and Beijing was officially announced after the uh, Central American country terminated uh, official diplomatic relations with Taiwan. It, it has begun the fifth Latin American country to take this step since uh, 2016. Uh, this step opened for Honduras the opportunity to join Belt and Road in Initiative. And during the official visit, uh, visit to China uh, this summer, President Xiamara Castro, uh, uh, she has requested the country's admission to the BRICS-led New Development Bank and also visited the Huawei Research Center in order to seek uh, technological cooperation. Uh, so my conclusion is very short. Uh, so these are the main considerations on the announcement topic. And in brief, Latin America countries seek to open the door uh, for the new possibilities. Uh, so it seems to me that BRICS uh, uh, could be uh, like a lock of this door and uh, China holds the key. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tatiana. Uh, do some, uh, some participants have uh, any questions for our speaker? Uh, may maybe our, our online uh, participant. Uh, uh, okay, we are passing to our next Russian speaker, Andrei Petakov. He's, uh, uh, repre he's representing the, also the Institute of Latin American Studies. The title of his report is The Current State of the Armed Forces of Latin America and the Extra-Regional Factors of Their Strengthening. Uh, Andrei Petakov is uh, one of the main Russian experts in uh, uh, armed forces in, in general yeah, and in Latin America in particular. Okay, uh, please, Andrei. Uh, as a state institution, the armed forces of Latin American countries maintain the sure development dynamics in 21 century and play more and more active role in the social political life of the region. The analysis of that problematics gives an opportunity to determine, uh, determine the armed force potentiality of the Latin American region, which is situated within the U uh, USA strategic interest orbit. At the end of the 20, beginning of the 21st century, the process of democratization unfolded in Latin America, during which the power structures were pushed into the background and in fact there was a freeze of the development of the institution of the armed forces in the first five years uh, of the current century there were no uh, significant fluctuation in the change in the quantitative parameters of armies in terms of the uh, composition. Therefore, the reference point can be considered um, where, uh, um, between uh, 207 uh, 208 when the development of the first edition of the left turn in the Latin America entered a dynamic phase and appeals to the military became more significant. Uh, from uh, two, uh, two, uh, 2007 to uh, 2023, there was uh, an increase in the military contingent. The quantitative build-up of armies also occurred uh, in countries that consistently followed the course of development of electoral institution. Uh, Argentina, Chile, Paraguay, Brazil. Uh, 
in Colombia, uh, the growth of the army is determined by indigenous factors, uh, internal armed conflict. High growth rates were recorded in the left radical uh, segment of the region, Venezuela, Bolivia, Nicaragua, Ecuador, which indicates a certain stake of the left forces on the armed forces as a <clears throat> uh, since the beginning of 21 century practically all the countries of latin america demonstrate the tendency to the growth of the active military staff proving the in, uh, uh, um, an increment of the militarization of the region that process represents one of the macro tendencies uh, characterizing the actual development of Latin American region. Uh, the militarization uh, degree uh, three group of countries are signed out. The stable height dynamic group, the middle dynamic indication group and the low indication group. Uh, there are three states on the uh, ascending track, uh, Argentina, Mexico, uh, and Chile. The main factor in the takeoff of the uh, Argentine military power was the implementation of a large scale program of modernization of the armed forces. In Chile, as in Argentina, an army modern, modernization program was implemented and large uh, state investment were made in the development of the military industry. Uh, in the regional army's transformation in 21th uh, century, the qualitative change is the appearance of the spectrum of new uh, non-traditional fu functions. The, uh, uh, the uh, uh, broadening of the social political functions of the military is related to the change, uh, changes in the attitudes to security in the countries of the region. It's uh, significant that the uh, absolute majority of the military political uh, doctrines of the countries of the region are purely defensive in nature. Uh, and in the, the white books uh, um, uh, uh, give maximum attention to non-traditional security threats. Uh, uh, the um, scrutiny of the military industrial complex uh, complexes of the Latin American country gives a reason to affirm that their potentiality is mainly restricted in its uh, characters. In turn, in determines uh, the dependency of the states of the region from the uh, importation of the military production. Despite the geographical proximity and uh, perception of Latin America as a zone of strategic interest of United States, is not uh, um, United States is not uh, at, uh, a, a leader in armed supplies. Uh, so uh, for, for the four largest Im importers of the region, uh, uh, USA in recent year are not the main supplies. Um, uh, the dependent and uh, uh, peripheric uh, characters of the region determ determines its quality as a market of the NATO country's military technical arsenal. Mm -hmm. That's all.
Uh, th thank you, Andre. Uh, Andre gave us like a sh short view on the uh, system of uh, of armed forces within the Western American region. Uh, any question to our speakers? Um, may I? Uh... Yes, sure. Uh, Vasily Kashin is a, a famous Russian specialist in China. Uh, as I understood, he is currently in China right now. Yeah, uh, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Mr. Kashin is very uh, known expert here, and so he will make a, he wants to make a interesting question. Uh, sorry, sorry for my technical difficulties because uh, Zoom is working strangely in China, probably because of the uh, Chinese firewall. I have just uh, like uh, I'm not a Latin America specialist, but I uh, just studied a little bit the Chinese cooperation experience, especially with Argentina, and uh, it seems that Chinese did try to implement several projects in defense industry with Argentina and they were ready to share technology, but uh, probably just one of them, uh, the technology transfer of helicopters, uh, French uh, squirrel helicopters, did produce some very modest results. They assembled some aircraft in Argentina, but all of the rest, like there were considerable projects, all failed because Argentinians were not capable of um, maintaining the, their part of the deal. They simply com uh, constantly cut their expenditure. So can we consider like Argentina to be a kind of uh, rising military power? Because it seems that they are not capable to implement even a single project. They had projects with Chinese on APC production, they had uh, some intentions even to buy Chinese fighters, nothing materialized. They had to constantly cut that. And like from what equipment they have, they uh, like uh, the state of the Argentinian military has appears to have been deteriorating for a very long time. Like they, uh, everything seems to be falling apart. So uh, that's 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 basically the question because the Chinese did try to consider these guys as the main uh, partners uh, in uh, their defense industrial expansion failed miserably. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Vasily. It w it wasn't a question; it was a, a additional, a small report. Uh, and uh, Alexander Zhibit, uh has a question, please, Alexander. Uh, yes, just a moment. Yes. Uh, hello once again. I I also want to add a few words about the uh, situation uh, of uh, Brazilian contribution uh, to the state of uh, armed affairs in uh, Latin America and South America, especially. No? I mean uh, that. Uh, Brazil is the central power in the regional security complex in South America by Buzan and Weaver, which is uh, a very no, no well-known uh, uh, work. And uh, now is the moment of interesting events uh, which uh, happen in the uh, armed forces of Brazil. First of all, it is modernization of armed forces. No? And uh, this modernization uh, it it has already it has started since 2014 15. Now uh, it has come to a moment when, uh, according to President uh, Lula da Silva, uh, a growth acceleration program was uh, proclaimed and adopted, and a considerable part of it will go to the defense, and this is the sign of uh, a changing uh, order. No? Uh, changing environment in international politics. Also, Brazil is very active in peace maintenance operations, about 50 missions, one of them, if I'm not mistaken, in uh, Lebanon, very near the, the, the uh, center of the conflict, and also uh, very, very many transparency activities 
like uh, the white book, which has always been uh, uh, modern, uh, was actualized, and military budgets openness of Brazil. Also, confidence measures operations uh, on the frontiers are building up uh, with many countries, with Colombia, with Venezuela, with uh, some other countries. And uh, I, I cannot uh, uh, forget about naval operations, which uh, are called here exercises, which take place in the Gulf of Guinea uh, against the pirates and drug traffic and illicit activities, as well as illicit fishery. I mean, these actions, they show the determination of Brazil to uh, have a very expanded uh, influence over the uh, region in terms of its security. So this, this is what I wanted to add to the speech of uh, uh, Mr. Pet Petakov. Thank you. Thank you for uh, that additional information. And now we are passing for, to our uh, last speaker, who is uh, Professor Lev Sakolchik. He's an associate professor at Higher School, of, Higher School of Economics University. He's my colleague uh, within the faculty. And the title of his report is U.S. Sanction Policy Toward Latin America, Cases of Official Narratives on Cuba and Venezuela. So please. Thank you so much. Next slide, please. Yes, uh, sanctions are one of the key instruments we use foreign policy. However, the paradox of the sanctions policy is that the goals of sanctions are not achieved in the most cases. Sanctions of the United States against Latin American countries such as Cuba and Venezuela in many ways serve as a vivid illustration of this phenomenon. One of the classical definitions of sanctions was proposed by Gary Harbour and his colleagues. You can see uh, this definition in the slide. They consider sanctions as deliberate actions of the states, a coalition of such states, or international organization to reduce, restrict, restrict or withdraw from customs, trade, or financial relations with the target country to achieve a political goals. Uh, next slide, please. Yes, some words about my uh, theory and methodology. The aim of this research is to study the effectiveness of the U.S. sanctions policy on the cases of Cuba and Venezuela. Uh, the study is based on the theory of constructive international relations. Also, the study is based on an agent-centric uh, approach. Um, in addition, we conducted a paradigmatic analysis of the narratives using a qualitative um, text analysis. The research proceeds from the hypothesis that it is possible to assess the effectiveness of the U.S. sanctions policy by correlating the interpretation of its results with the stated foreign policy goals of democratization of the target countries. Um, some words about source base of sources. Uh, the source base is formed from the materials of the official websites of the United, United of the US federal authorities involved in foreign policy implementation. Uh, the paper analyzes uh, sanctions related documents, speeches, statements, press conferences. They are supplemented with information from publications of analytical centers, mass media, and databases. Next slide, please. Uh, case of Cuba, the U.S. sanctions policy against Cuba began in 1959 in connection with the revolution of Castro against the Batista regime. However, in 2014, President Obama had to admit that sanctions had not worked and the goals of democratization had not been achieved. The same year, uh, the American administration launched an initiative to improve relations with Cuba. President Trump in 2017 tightened U.S. sanctions policy towards Cuba on the ground of human rights. Almost all the concessions with the country were canceled. President Biden, who promised during the election campaign to cut the restrictive measures against Cuba, did not ease the sanctions regime. 
The political situation in Cuba is assessed from the point of view of American official narrative as authoritarian. The American administration is um, also very concerned that China already has an intelligence center in Cuba and can further expand cooperation with Havana. In general, uh, modern studies also point to the weak effectiveness of US sanctions in the context of democratization of Cuba. In addition, they highlight the negative effect of US sanctions on human rights in the country. Technology-related restrictions uh, have led, for example, to a serious slowdown in the development of countries' healthcare, education, and science. Next slide, please. Case of Venezuela. In the in US first imposed, uh, I'm sorry, the US first imposed sanctions on Venezuela in 2008, which were related uh, to the lack of cooperation of Caracas in the fight against terrorism and drugs, sanctions based on the protection of human rights and uh, fight against um, uh, authoritarian regime was stated in the narrative in 2014, when the US Congress passed the law on protection of human rights and civil society in Venezuela. At the beginning of his term, President Trump strengthened sanctions against the country in, and in January 2019, Guaido, as the head of the National Assembly, assumed the role of interim president of the country. And the same day, the US State Department announced the recognition of Guaido as the legitimate head of the country. In December 2019, the US Congress passed the Bipartisan Act to prevent Maduro regime from assessing financial instruments and uh, some aid. Uh, in addition, the US sanctions regime amounted to broad measures against a number of officials, state-owned companies, including the largest oil company of Venezuela. However, the sanctions had not weakened the Maduro regime. Meanwhile, Guaido had first fled to Colombia and then to the United States. In general, a number of researchers consider the case of Venezuela as one of the clearest examples of strengthening of authoritarian tendencies under the influence of US sanctions. Moreover, Russia and China seek to develop cooperation with the government of Maduro. In addition, like in case of Cuba, we can see that sanctions have seriously affected human rights in the country and intensify the humanitarian crisis. Next slide, please. What about the results uh, of our research? Uh, international relations are described as the rivalry of democracy and autocracy on global scale in the United States uh, and uh, their official narrative. Thus, the motive of protection of human rights and democracy is used by the United States to justify sanctions against a number of Latin American countries. The US narrative is structured in such a way so as to avoid recognizing the erosion of US hegemony in the region. At the same time, the, uh, the, the, the issues of democratic development of Latin American countries are fundamental of the United States. American narrative describes that the threat to the United States and the region emanates from Russia, China, and other so-called authoritarian countries. Yes, of course, we can find some changes in political regimes uh, have been observed both in China and Venezuela, uh, but in general, um, uh, general trend is to strengthen resistance of political regimes to sanctions and further regime consolidation, despite the serious deterioration of social and economic situation in these countries. Cuba and Venezuela are striving to develop cooperation with the key US competitors in the region, such as Russia and uh, China, of course. Uh, they come becoming, uh, uh, these uh, countries uh, are becoming the important political, military, and economic uh, partners. In general, the analysis of the cases shows low effectiveness of US sanctions. Since American foreign policy goals of democratization, promotion of liberal values, protection of human rights have already not been achieved. Next slide, and thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Lev. We have uh, one last question to our speaker. Thank you. I have uh, possibly a possibly provocative question. 
Uh, so if we one day wake up and uh, in this imaginary world, there are no more sanctions towards Venezuela and Cuba. So what do you think? Uh, if this uh, possibly uh, lead uh, uh, to the uh, termination of the regimes uh, or in the opposite, uh, they uh, have already so much adopted uh, to the uh, to the sanctions. Uh, so no, uh, will it lead that it will stabilize the regime uh, and uh, make it more firmer? Or in opposite, uh, they are so, so adopted to the sanctions, so they will leave without uh, this, uh, or it will ruin the regime. So you you have understood. Thank you so much for this brilliant question. Uh, um, uh, first of all, I would like to say that um, 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 in amount of research we can find uh, the uh, very common uh, thesis about uh, that authoritarian regimes and authoritarian leaders uh, use uh, uh, sanctions and uh, mm, some uh, maybe um, costs and benefits from uh, uh, this uh, situation for this uh, for for their for their power. That's why in this situation I can say that uh, I think it will be a very good uh, uh, price. For these regimes, and they and they will use uh, this uh, uh, victory uh, uh, to legitimize their uh, policy, uh, domestic foreign policy, and uh, um, their uh, political regime, as well as uh, authoritarian uh, institutions in their countries. Yeah, thank you so much. Yes, and Steve Elner. Yes, th thank you. Um, yeah, I have uh, two questions. One is with regard to the issue of human rights and other issues involved in the sanctions. Uh, Bloomberg News, uh, which is a good source of information, especially with regard to economic issues, um, has indicated over a period of you know maybe a year or two that the Biden administration, in addition to issues of democracy, um, is also uh, interested in wringing concessions from the Maduro government and is using sanctions in order to pressure the Maduro government to modify his economic policies, that economics has something to do with the sanctions. But the question I have is, in addition to that, which is Pretty, pretty well known that it's not just about human rights, it's also about economic policy, especially towards you know, multinational corporations that invest in Venezuela, invest in Venezuelan oil. In addition to that, at the time of a meeting, a delegation from the United States um, that negotiated, that met with representatives of the Maduro government about a year and a half ago, um, there was some speculation in the press that there was another issue involved also, that the Maduro government, uh, this was right after the beginning of the conflict in Ukraine, that the US government was interested in Maduro moving away from the pro-Russian position, um, perhaps maintaining more of an independent position or opposing Russian uh, presence in Ukraine. Um, that that There was some speculation about that. It wasn't really, heavily discussed, but I was wondering what your opinion is on that. And the second question, which is perhaps more of a statement than a question, there's the issue that you raise with regard to do sanctions strengthen authoritarian governments or do sanctions move governments, whether they be authoritarian or democratic, in an authoritarian position? You know, uh, you could say that these sanctions amount to a type of warfare, um, a warfare what some call war on Venezuela, perhaps war on Cuba, war without military intervention, but an economic war. And it's a well-known fact that war and democracy are incompatible. In the United States, which is a democratic country, World War I, the United States um, uh, repressed uh, pacifist 
leaders, such as Eugene Debs, a very famous labor leader who was jailed because he was opposed to U.S. involvement in World War I. And World War II, the same kind of thing with the um, uh, camps that Japanese people or U.S. Uh, U.S. people with Japanese uh, 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 of Japanese origin were thrown into camps uh, and lost their property. And there are a lot of other specifics that could be mentioned. But there's no question that war and sanctions are incompatible. So the second question that I have is with regard to that, is it a question of authoritarian governments being able to use the sanctions as excuses, or is it a question of governments that are fairly democratic? but moving in a non-democratic uh, direction as a result of the sanctions. Well, uh, thank you so much for your very brief questions. Um, um, to, um, uh, for, for deep uh, uh, and uh, uh, deep answer, I need uh, one or two hours, uh, but I don't have. Uh, well, uh, your first question about economic, um, mm, consequences, democracy um, mm, in Venezuela. Mm, uh, yeah. Um, well, um, uh, back to our research, I uh, would to say that um, we studied only official narrative of uh, current um, American, uh, current American um, administration, administration of, the, of Biden. Uh, and uh, in our point of view, the main uh, uh, topic of this uh, mm, of this uh, narrative towards Latin America uh, is about uh, democracy, democratization, human rights, uh, uh, liberal values. And that's why uh, we decided that uh, the main foreign policy goal for the United States right now is to democratize, um, is to democratize, um, uh, to intensify process of democratization in uh, uh, the countries under consideration. Um, uh, it's only about our, fo our focus. Of course, we can uh, say that uh, there are a lot of um, economic consequences, costs um, uh, for these countries, Cuba and Venezuela, of course. Uh, but in our point of view, in our perspective, um, we, um, uh, we can say that uh, uh, US sanctions are not effective, uh, uh, are not effective because, uh, of, uh, um, because of these uh, specific goals, uh, which are not uh, achieved right now. Uh, what about your second question uh, about sanctions? It is all about definitions. It is all about discussion about what sanctions are, uh, what uh, uh, what is uh, um, uh, what is they about. Uh, one of uh, the common uh, um, uh, view in literature, which you can um, uh, read. Uh, it is about that uh, sanctions and uh, economic war are absolutely different, absolutely different things. That's why uh, we mm, decided to choose uh, uh, the definition of uh, Gary Half Bauer about um, mm, uh, uh, poly policy change of target country. That's why we can say that sanctions and economic war are uh, different uh, because economic war uh, more about um, more about benefits uh, of international trade, uh, more about economy, national economy, or international trade of uh, different countries, especially about uh, international trade of the United States. If we're talking about your sanction policy. Uh, 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 um, uh, uh, when we're talking about sanctions, we're especially talking about political goals. Uh, that's why we decided to analyze U.S. sanctions policy towards Latin America in the way 
of uh, achieving, ach uh, uh, achieving especially political goals. Uh, that's why, yeah, thanks so much. Hello, I have a question if I can, or yes. comment. Yes, yes. Um, I, I think it's wiser to take a question like are sanctions effective or not and recognize that it can vary from context to context. For example, uh, there's little doubt that economic sanctions on South Africa helped. Maybe I, I wouldn't even go so far as to say they were decisive, but they certainly, certainly uh, seem to help move forward the collapse of the apartheid regime and, and the freedom for Nelson Mandela. Um, on the other hand, I, I, I would have more agreement on the Latin American cases. Um, I certainly don't think the sanctions largely are there because the United States uh, sincerely wants to bring about democracy. I, I think the United States will even tolerate Maduro. Maduro makes the kinds of changes that Steve, uh, well, I think Steve alluded to before, and uh, particularly on oil, he's already opened he's already opened the country up for more exploitation of its mining uh, resources in very sensitive areas of the country. And um, and and uh, I, if we ever get to see the contracts that his government has signed, I suspect that they're very generous to the oil companies. You know, you can increase oil production, but if you don't actually uh, siphon some of the profits off for your own needs, in Venezuela's case, reconstruction, you don't you don't get anywhere. Um, I, I another comment I have, which might pertain more to Professor Rorota No. Uh, I hope I can get this right, Barat Nikolva's uh, presentation is that I was thinking about the Central America region and the, the changes going on now in Guatemala and Honduras and the shift to sort of center left governments and promising developments of, 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 of mobilization towards at least more democratic uh, government in those areas and how the United States, the dilemma the United States faces in reacting to these changes, because the large issue that I don't think anybody has brought up in terms of U.S. relations with Latin America, the biggest right now is probably immigration, which of course is partly driven but in both the Cuban and the Venezuelan cases by sanctions that have taken whatever mistakes those governments made on their own account and made them much more painful and particularly in the Venezuela case, where it's well documented that although Venezuela was in decline, probably the decline probably really started in 2012. But after 2014, uh, it really got worse. And then a precipitous decline after the U.S. sanctions were imposed. Those That in turn has driven a massive migration northward, which is now shaking North American politics. Um, and and probably inclining it in very undemocratic ways, by the way. So um, I think in any look at the overall security situation and the kinds of the kinds of problems that a more autonomous Latin America have to deal with, we have to look at the at the causes that are driving migration. Uh, certainly, they include climate change. Certainly, they include uh, basic economic problems, but they also include punishing sanctions and refusal of the United States to really um, look at the, at the export-oriented capitalist model that they've imposed on certain countries in the Central American region. Well, yes, so thank you. I don't necessarily address any one speaker, so, but. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your additional interesting speech and unfortunately i have to finish our round table because uh in moscow time we are almost at uh, 9 p.m now <laughs> and uh, but uh, i i consider i consider that kind of event as a very successful we had uh, a great i don't know uh, interchange of opinion opinions on uh, issues and state of affairs in Latin American regions. I want to especially thank to my invited speakers from US, Brazil, 
uh, who uh, who uh, presented uh, their very interesting um, point of view on uh, on the topic of our round table. I hope that I have created some kind of new tradition uh, of that uh, of, of that type of events that will take place uh, sometimes <laughs> during uh, uh, the year. And uh, so we hope that uh, you will also uh, participate in our uncommon events. Thanks again for participating. And uh, saludos y abrazos desde Moscú. Good night to you in Moscow. Yeah. OK. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you. Yes, it's an honor to be here. Well, it was very, very fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. I will share the link of the right. video to all our speakers and uh, see you on our next events. Bye. Bye. Bye.